You're listening to Tone Benders, the sound designer's podcast. Let's do this. Hello and welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Tim Muirhead and I will be your host today. We are lucky to be joined by Sergio Diaz and Zach Sievers, who are the co-supervising sound editors of Chloe Zhao's new film, Nomadland. The film is about the nomad lifestyle of mostly senior citizens who live in vans and travel around America to grab seasonal work where they can. The film stars Frances McDormand and is a work of beauty. People talk about film poetry. This movie really has a poetry to it. It's a thing of beauty that made me cry in both joy, sadness, and depicts a language of loneliness on film that I'm not sure I've seen before. I went into the movie not really knowing what I was getting into, and I was ready to take sound notes throughout the whole film, and I ended up just getting lost in the film, and my eyes were puffy from all the tears I cried during the movie. I loved this movie in a way that uh, I haven't loved a movie in a little while, and uh, I hope that everyone listening to this gets a chance to go see it and uh, really takes it in because it's a beautiful film. It features very little underscore music and not a ton of dialogue, so Nomadland leaves a lot of room for sound to help tell the story. And leading that charge, we have Zach Sievers, who worked on the film from LA and was in charge of all aspects of dialogue for the film, as well as the re-recording mixer. Zach's past credits include Hearts Beat Loud, a great Nick Offerman indie film that I also really loved, and the Tom Hanks produced doc series, the 60s, the 70s, the 90s. Welcome to the show, Zach. Uh, was this your first time working with the director of Nomadland, Chloe Zhao? Yes, it was. She seems like someone that would be really great to work with, and I think we're going to dig into that a little bit in the interview. But Excellent. Also joining us is Sergio Diaz. Sergio worked on Nomadland from Mexico City and was the sound designer as well as the supervisor looking over the sound effects side of the soundtrack. Sergio's past credits include Pan's Labyrinth. Oh, Pan's Labyrinth. That movie is something. He's also worked on Roma, was Oscar nominated for Roma. Welcome to the show, Sergio. Thank you for having me, Tim. Thank you so much. Sergio, you were in charge of the ambiences, I guess, for this film. And as I mentioned in that intro, there's long scenes where there's just ambiences to tell the story. Uh, the ambiences are out in the open. We have a lot of films where people spend a lot of time editing BGs and atmospheres. And then in the final mix, it just gets clobbered by giant score and humongous sound effect sequences. But in this film, the ambiences are just wide open. A past guest on our podcast, Javier Casada, said about working with you, Sergio is one of the best at building rich, believable, and evocative atmospheres. His approach to building atmospheres is really unique and one of the best things I've learned from working with him. Can you elaborate on your approach to ambiences and how you applied that to this film? Yeah, my first approach to the film, I, I just write in my, my own notes, and I remember that I put fragility for this movie because the treatment of the universe of soundscape should be aware of the fragility meaning. So um, because there was a thin line between fiction and nonfiction, so we did the sound design around the age. My collaboration and my selection was to choose the right layers for, this, for each sequence and contribute to the, to the story and try to embrace every sequence with, with Fern. The director, Chloe Zhao, gave you a roadmap for the ambiences, but I think that's a literal thing. She literally gave you a roadmap? Yeah, she literally gives me a roadmap. So can you explain this a bit? Yeah, it was really, really good because Chloe Zhao has clear idea what she expects from the soundscape. In every single sequence, I knew where we are in geography. The, the production sound, I mean, was my guide through the real sounds and perspective from the location. So what I did is to put layers to contribute to the story again. So it was a, a huge uh, work uh, looking into my own library that I have been recording a lot of stops during many, many years. This was a great opportunity for me to use that kind of sound, so yeah. So this film was tackled, uh, the post for it was tackled post lockdown, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our collaboration with Chloe was very unique because of the pandemic. We did everything remotely. 
however, all the times was very productive since our first video conference. I was very enthusiastic because she was very clear with the idea and her duration uh, uh, for the sound design. So our goal was to convey the audience into the real perspective of French fragility. And it was a good experience for me. So Zach, you're based in LA. That's right. Yeah. And Sergio's in Mexico City. That's correct. Right. What was the original plan when you guys signed on for this to eventually uh, meet up and work together in the same room? Or were you always planning to be uh, working in separate cities? Because the pandemic had already started by the time we were beginning conversations with each other and with Chloe, it was pretty clear that it wouldn't be feasible to be able to work in person with each other. So at some point, I think there was some concern as to whether or not we would actually be able to mix the film in person together but Chloe was pretty adamant that she wanted to try to figure that out. We really wanted to try to make that happen. And, and so we were really fortunate that we were able to work in a large enough room in a facility that had really great protocols in place so that we could actually do that. How do you deal with Loop Group in a pandemic, Zach? That's a great question. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I've worked with a dialogue group supervisor for many years uh, named Georgia Simon. And uh, Georgia was really open to the idea of working remotely. She, she had done some minimal work at this point working remotely. And so we came up with a system in which she could work with each of her group members. Uh, we would provide each one of them a microphone and a home recording system. And, you know, some folks, some supervisors have, have run Zoom sessions and collaborated by guiding group that way in a live setting similar to what you would do, you know, if you were running a real group session. But in our case, we, we actually decided that we wanted each of the group members to work independently from each other and just give them specific notes and specific requests of the things that we needed. And then they would go about and record variations on those things. And, and then we would give Chloe an opportunity to listen to it cut into the scene once it had all been built out against Sergio's design. And that gave her a chance to be able to hear it you know, working in the film and whether or not that actually gelled or not. And then we would go back and, you know, re-record things that we needed to if it wasn't quite the, the kind of sound that she was looking for. This film features only two professional actors, as far as I can tell. For the most part. The rest of the actors, I believe, are people who are actually kind of living that nomad lifestyle. Correct. Did you have any need to bring any of them in for ADR? And how do you track them down for that? Well, it's tricky. Um, we didn't have a whole lot of ADR because the production sound was really, really beautifully recorded and very nicely captured. And also, Chloe, just even for things that were, you know, on the edge of, of intelligibility or maybe a little more noisy than normal, she would always opt for preferring production sound just because it's the real sound. And that's very much a part of her filmmaking style. But in the case of uh, our non-actors, we did have a two or three lines that we needed to capture just because they were things that were missing from the story or we just really couldn't make out what they were saying. The person, Linda May, it turns out she's an amazing actor, uh, even though she's not an, an actor. Um, we had to get in touch with her and she was in the middle of nowhere. I still don't know exactly where she was. It was somewhere like a, a BLM land um, situation similar to, to what she projects in the film. We shipped her a microphone, a Shure MV88, in a small UPS package, and she opened it up, hooked it up to her phone, and that's basically how we captured the sound. But the crazy thing with her was that she was in the middle of nowhere. So it was very quiet, and she was able to step outside and record outside in a really perfectly clean environment and capture exterior dialogue that was super close to what we needed in the film. It was amazing. That's perfect. Was wind an issue when you were cleaning up dialogue at all? This film has lots of scenes that take place in kind of open, deserty like environments, and I would assume that there'd be a lot of wind whipping through there. Yeah, there, there was a fair amount of wind in the film, uh, but never, I can only think of a couple of scenes. There's a scene at, towards the end of the film with, with Bob Wells that had some tricky uh wind noise um but for the most part i think what worked so well about sergio's design was that he he would embrace the qualities of the sound and so we we would really not try to hide away or suppress a lot of those anomalies that you would otherwise try to clean out we would just say that is what it sounds like and then sergio would go in and add sounds and designs that harmonize with those issues and, and ultimately mask them to the point that we really didn't have to do a whole lot of noise reduction or equalization to, to clean those things out. And we really wanted to protect the performance of uh, the characters. So that helped with that as well. 
So, Sergi, how did you go about adding those wins to protect that original dialogue? The most challenging was to preserve this dramatic art with this minimalistic treatment of the soundscape. In many ways, I thought that less is more, so I need to choose the right elements to apport to the story, but with really good quality and specific sound layers to tell the story hand in hand with your inner idea. So for me, the all the universe, all the sound design always goes hand in hand with your inner idea. And if you stay through to it, it will tell you exactly everything you want to convey. So basically, I, I did my own research and I bring a lot of ambiences and backgrounds, but specifically, I work a lot with winds, specific winds with some density for winter, spring, summer, autumn, all the seasons. So I just explore all of that sounds and try to live harmoniously with everything included with the music from Ludovico, which is... Ludovico and Audi, he wrote the music for Nomadland. So beautiful. But when Ludovico appears, Ludovico should be the hero in that moment. But at the same time, <laughs> we have a lot of layers around that music. We'd be very lucky because we have the, a lot of stems from the music and layers, a lot of layers from the sound design. And Zach did an amazing job at the final mix. The mix is really impressive because, as I mentioned earlier, when you're watching the movie, you get sucked into it in a way almost like a documentary. It has that documentary feel to it, as well as you're obviously aware it's not a documentary because it's Francis McDormand. I really enjoyed the sound of this movie. And one of the things that I enjoyed is that at the same time as you're in these humongous open spaces... When she gets into her van, it's suddenly a claustrophobic thing. You know, she's uh, in a very small space. And Sergio, I wonder if you could address how you approach the ambiences for the interior of the vans. Yeah, I, I build in my mind three stages of the sound design. Prominent, serenity, and then with silence. Inside the van should be everything very prominent. Fern is always exposed to the real world with this extreme weather. Fern is Frances McDormand's character. Yeah, exactly. For those moments, our idea was to put the audience in real perspective, having the same feeling of her fragility. Same case with the crowds and industrial environment at the Amazon warehouse. So we try to put a lot of details around us winds, cracks, and wildlife, and all that stuff to, like, I live in a thin can, you know what I mean? And so, for me, it was very important to put the audience in that perspective. So the sound inside the van is very prominent. Yeah, you brought up the Amazon warehouse. Those scenes are very different from almost the entire rest of the movie. Yeah. Also in those scenes, there is source music that tells us elements of the story. Like, I don't think they particularly say that it's Christmas time, but because you're hearing Christmas music, you know that it's a different time of year. Yeah. As well as uh, there are times when she's listening to the radio and the radio is kind of giving you subtle intricacies of information. Was that scripted or did you guys find that on your own? Well, Chloe had actually recorded things during filming. Uh, that were just radio things. And then she also found things in post-production because she also edited the film and she would lay in things and, and she just sort of found random sounding radio advertisements that she liked the sound of that put the right kind of sense of humor into the film very subtly, also set time and place, as you said, and created a vibe. But ultimately those things were not clearable and licensable. So we ultimately re-recorded similar sounding dialogue with group which ultimately was just improvisation. We had each of the actors just kind of go and do whatever. And, and they came up with the funniest sort of bits, like the part where Fern is going to Walmart, as you mentioned, and there's just sort of this ridiculous advertisement going on in the background, or it's an NPR segment. Those were things that they just came up with on the spot. It's really interesting that she does use the source music consistently. It's really the only music that plays within scenes. Most of the time, Ludovico's score waits until these moments of silence. And, you know, we, we have those beautiful montage sequences where we're really kind of able to get into Fern's mind. 
So you mentioned that Chloe was both the director and the picture editor for this project. When you're working with someone who's that involved with it, what kind of notes are you getting back after you send her uh, sound sketches and such like that? Yeah, it was a, it was a really good uh, experience because we tried to work every single day for 10 minutes of the film just to finish 30 minutes around during two weeks and then send my 10 tracks to Zach and then Zach put the dialogues and do a uh, final adjustments and put uh, everything for, for Chloe. And thanks to the technology of Evercast video conference tool, we were able to work at the, the same time. I mean, we go through, through the film and we take notes during that screening with her and Zach in different spaces. And she was very specific all the time. And, and she discovered a new things during the process. And she was very happy and, and give us some feedbacks to put a different layers or things around us. So for me, it was, was a very enjoyable process with, with Chloe. I think what's interesting about Chloe is maybe it's a product of the fact that she has made films with real people who are not comfortable on camera and is able to create these performances and tell these amazing stories that are so real. She's a really special person and talking to her and communicating with her as an artist is really encouraging and supportive and she has a way of bringing the best out of you and inspiring you and making you laugh and have a good time. And sometimes with filmmaking, it can be really stressful. And it was never stressful. She's just, she listens to the work and then she reacts to it and she has positive things to say about it. She never says anything pessimistically or negatively about, you know, it, you always feel like, okay, maybe that wasn't the right sound. Let's try something else. Or, oh, that was an interesting discovery. I like what you were doing there, but let's try and go in this different direction. And that, that really brought, I think, a lot of really great ideas to the table for both of us. Yeah. For, for me, my conclusion always is uh, to the sound design always goes hand in hand with the original idea. So that was our goal from Zach and me to preserve that idea from Chloe and make everything happen for, for her. So I think we, we did a great job and we did a great collaboration together. Just one last question, Sergio, with all the wins in the film, as you were mentioning before, were they all actual wind recordings or did you do any uh, sound design with synths or anything for the winds to create movement? I used a very nice tool in, in my Pro Tools. The plugin is Flux. Flux came from France and it's so beautiful to bring more density. I do it a lot of layers, but we're actually recording in, in different locations. But after that, I did some tricky things with, with them. Thank you very much for joining us today. It was really great to have you on. And as I said, uh, I love this film. And uh, I'm sure when they were shooting this movie, they didn't understand the weird resonance it was going to have in COVID times. But it seems like a movie that's very much the right movie for the right time. It's, it's really great. So I'm jealous that you guys got to work on something so amazing. And uh, all the best to you both. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much, Tim. Film Bitters is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Moro. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. 